not this past week, but the week before, Bill and I were extremely busy. You see, I had, I was hoping some, who here has ever moved from one house to another? Let me see your hands. Oh gosh, all of us. Well, we were extremely busy because we were helping my sister move from one house to another. So a three-story house to an apartment. And it was quite something. Yeah, 25 years, and she wanted to be here this morning. She really did. I was talking to her when I got here to let her know I was getting okay. She, I wish I could be there this morning. But she has each of you in our prayers that she needs to spend time with her husband in the hospital. It was quite something. She has, like, in the old place, in the townhouse, there's 28 sets. 28 steps. There's four sets of seven stairs, so four times seven, 28. So we were up the stairs, down the stairs, up the stairs, down the stairs. I felt like that old British sitcom, upstairs, downstairs. And we were lifting, oh, I was lifting heavy boxes. Her husband couldn't do anything. And Bill was, Bill was doing all the cleaning, and all the vacuuming, for which he did a fantastic job. I lifted the boxes. The movers, of course, were there. They moved all the furniture and all the big stuff, but the other stuff, like, we had to pack in small boxes. So a lot of that I was helping her with. And, of course, she only had a week because she had to be out by the 28th. The house had been sold. And so it seemed at times that there was so much, I mean, 25 years of living in the one place, you accumulate a lot of stuff. <clears throat> now, I've been living in my house, come December, will be 60 years. So I know I have a lot accumulated too, but that's the story for another day. So we worked from Sunday, the 20th of September, until around 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon that week. And the only break we took was for Sabbath hours. And I was so thankful for the Sabbath. It was a very busy week and very, very tiring. Sometimes, you know, you kind of got discouraged. I, I don't know, going to meet the deadline. And, and I kept saying to her, yeah, we're going to meet this. I'm going to have you out of here before the 28th. But, you know, we still had a lot to do. She still had lots to do before the movers came. She still had a lot of preparing to do a lot of preparing before the actual moving day. And so this morning, I want to have a look at our spiritual and physical moving day from planet Earth to the New Jerusalem, to heaven. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your Sabbath. We thank you that there's a moving day coming. And Lord, I am just a humble vessel, just a humble servant, just a piece of clay in your hands, Lord, the potter's hands. I ask, Father, that you would speak to me and through me. And Lord, that it would, you would speak to each one of us this day. Father, as you give us words on high, preparing us, for a moving day is coming. We thank you and give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just as the preparation of packing items and getting rid of things that are no longer any good, that we have a tendency to hold on to stuff, otherwise known as junk, and I can tell you some things that we're being held on to. 
but that's another story for another day. Stuff that at least one thing I know is 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 definitely uh, uh, fifty six years old. But I kind of convinced her. Listen, girl, Nan's gone. She's been gone for sixty since sixty four year nineteen sixty four. It's time. We put her to rest. Time to put this other thing to rest. So I just gave that a flick in the uh, in the dumpster. She said, "Yeah, you're right." So it was a busy, busy time, <clears throat> and we are all busy. This is a busy time for everybody. But as we are followers of Jesus Christ, we must prepare for our moving day. Now, Jesus calls this watchfulness and preparation. Some time ago during camp meeting, actually it was back in 2014, so that's about six years ago, I purchased a book written by Randy Roberts. We all know Randy Roberts. It was entitled Waiting and Longing, and it's from this book that I want to share with you today. If we turn to in our Bibles to Mark 13, Mark chapter 13, verse 35 to 37, it says, Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowning of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And Selena so beautifully read that this morning. Thank you very much. And I always thought, even back in my Pentecostal days, that, okay, you know, watch. Okay, that must mean that i got to keep my eye on the eastern sky. So I look out my kitchen window, and I can get a perfect view of my the eastern sky. You can see the Cabot Tower from my house. You can see it all. And I thought, okay, so I just got to look to see when he's coming. Just got to look for that, that sign in the sky. But when I became Adventist, I learned that the sign was that small dark cloud that keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And after reading Randy Roberts' book, I've actually learned what watching meant. You see, when Jesus stated to watch, that's what I thought, just look at the sky, but it means so much more. So what does it mean to watch? Where should the focus of our attention be? What exactly are we watching? Many today are watching the turbulent, deadly events in nature. I mean, I watch it too, you know, because the Bible, Jesus did tell us that there would be in the last days earthquakes, famines, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, and pestilences, which we already have, and I don't think it's going to stop where it's at. Other people are watching political and international news. Yeah, and I do too, and I know we all do. Many of us keep an eye on the religious and political leaders around the globe. I'm always watching. You see the Sunday law. You know, the blue, co blue laws, they call them. Some people are watching the state of the church, Christian church. Some people like to keep an eye on the charts and the like. But you know, that's not what Jesus meant. None of these is what Jesus tells us to watch. Yes, it's good to watch. I like to be in the know because we are to know what's coming. Right? So we don't be don't be fooled by it. 
were not taken unawares of it. So I, as usual, walked into my library at home, pulled out the all good old Webster Dictionary. You gotta love him. He got everything there. So I looked up the word, I mean, the dictionary's that big, so I looked up the word watch. And of course, the meaning's that long. And what caught my eye is exactly what I was looking for. The word watch means on the alert, to be careful, cautious, keep awake, stay on guard, don't let your guard down, as we've often heard people say. So how do we watch? How do we do these things? Well, the answers are found in Matthew chapters 24 and 25, and that's where we're going to spend our time to this morning. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. And these are the words of Christ, these two chapters. In my Bible, all written in red, the disciples asked him, and he gave them the answers. In Matthew 24 and verse 51, which is where we're going to start. I'm sorry, Matthew. Oh, yeah, Matthew. 24, verse 40, 45, I'm sorry. Matt, see, I'm tired, still tired from the, all that moving. So Matthew 24, verses 45 to 51. It's one of the first four parables where Jesus answers our question. You see, number one, watching, means doing. Doing the master's bidding. In this passage of scripture, he states, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming, and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion, and hip, portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see in this scripture that the master of the house leaves on a trip and he places a servant in charge. And the position he puts him in is a position of trust, a high position. The master implies he will return, but he does not say when or how soon, but only that he will definitely return. Further implications is that the servant's behavior during his master's absence will determine whether or not he is ready to meet the master when he returns. From this parable, the servant can make two choices. The servant has two choices, just as we do. Do what his master has asked him to do which is provide for his fellow servants as instructed or neglect to do it and just go sit on the couch and watch the rest of the world go by. If the servant does what he is supposed to do, it means he will be ready when the master returns. However, neglecting to do it is to be caught unprepared. How faithful 
will we be in doing what the Master, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was crucified on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, to die the death of a villain for your sins and mine. How faithful will we be to do what he has left for us to do? Will we faithfully provide all his children? And I mean all his children, not just a few that we may like, but all his children with spiritual food at the proper time. Could it be that this parable tells us that watching does not primarily consist of figuring out when Christ is coming? But rather, watching means doing whatever it is that he has left for us to do? Then watching is primarily concerned with whether or not we are faithful in doing the tasks that he has left us to do. You see, Jesus is very much, very much interested in a people who will be faithful in their duties to him, whether or not he is present, whether or not his, his delay in coming. Whatever Jesus has called us to do, we must do with the persistent kindness of those who wish to be faithful to Christ. You see, when we do that, we will be watching. Simple word, but oh, what a powerful meaning. As we move on to chapter 25, verses 1 to 13, we have the second parable, and we're all familiar with this parable, and it's number two of what watching means. Watching means knowing, knowing Jesus on a personal, enduring basis. In Matthew 25, the 20, uh, verse 1 to 13, we have the parable of the ten virgins, the bridesmaids. But I want you to notice the punchline in the last verse, in the last verse of chapter 25, verse 13 of Matthew, watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Keep watch. Why? Because you do not know the day or the hour when the bridegroom will return. So keep watch. Be always ready. We are to be ready as if his coming was today. In this story, Jesus portrays a wedding where the focus is not on the bride, but on the bridesmaids. Now, I'm going to say it. I've always been a bridesmaid, never a bride. So I know what the bridesmaids do. And as we look in on this wedding and see these bridesmaids, for all intents and purposes, everything looks well. They're ready for the ceremony. They're all dressed alike. Usually the bridesmaids were all dressed alike. They all have their lanterns. They're all excited, and they're all waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. So that when he comes, they will travel with him on his procession to claim his bride. But if we look a little bit closer, we see all is not well. There's trouble at the ceremony. You see, because in verse 2, Jesus states, five were foolish and five were wise. So that tells me that some kind of trouble lies ahead. If we are to understand what Jesus comprises the difference between foolishness and wisdom, we must note one phrase in verse 5. 
Look at verse 5, chapter 25. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. The bridegroom was a long, long time in coming. So there is the difference. It was the delay that caused it. If the bridegroom had appeared when he was expected to appear, all the bridesmaids would have been ready. And we would have thought that all of them were wise. But because of the delay, we realized that five were foolish. Likewise, a lengthy, a lengthy wait for Jesus coming has affected his church. You know, we see, we should not be surprised. I mean, he has told us all these things will come upon the earth. The early Christians expected Jesus to come almost immediately. But here we are approximately 2,000 years later, and we are still waiting for his coming. And things are getting bad upon the earth. I don't need to tell you what's been going on. We see it, you and I see it, when we turn on our television. Laws that are being made that go against God's laws. And, and now this disease, you know, my dad's been gone 26 years, and, and Bill can attest to this, that oftentimes we've heard dad say, don't you think it's time, Lord, that you came? And that was 26 years ago. Things have gotten worse since then. But just because Jesus has not come yet does not mean we are to be spiritually asleep. We need to wake up people. We are to be drawing closer to Jesus. We are to be studying the word more as the day star approaches. We need to have prayer. We need to be in constant communication with our Heavenly Father. We need to be worshiping him. Remember what Jesus said, his own words in Matthew 24, verses 21 to 22. Then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless the days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. If you think this is bad now, hold on, because the winds are coming. And they're going to be gusting beyond what we ever have ever imagined. Don't be like those bridesmaids. Draw nearer. And still nearer and nearer again. And when you think you can't get any closer, draw closer still to Jesus. It is who you know when things get a lot worse. It is Jesus only that can look after us, that can look after you. It's, you know, when I used to go get a job, when I first started the job, hunt many years ago. People used to say, you know, when you go in for your, it's who you know, not what you know. Well, I got to be honest, that is true. In this case, it is true. It is who you know. It's all in who you know when it comes to waiting and watching for the coming of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. It's all in who you know. Watching means knowing Jesus in a personal, enduring way. 
And yes, as we talked about in Sabbath school this morning, there are times we may slip, we may fall, but let's get back up on that wagon. Let's get back up on that bandwagon and confess our sins to Jesus Christ. And he will restore. Now, while probation is still in effect, because one day, and it's coming, it's coming. One day, the throne of grace will be shut closed. And what is holy will be holy still, and what is unjust will be unjust still. Watching means knowing Jesus. you got to get so close to him that when he comes, there's not going to be no big change in you, as the song says. I want to get as close to Jesus as I can. And I know Jesus wants me to get as close to him. And he's going to pull out all the stops, whatever it takes for that to happen. And if that means I have to leave maybe family and friends who do not want to go along with Jesus, then that's what it means. Number three, we look in Matthew 25, verses 14 to 30. Watching means using our talents to increase his kingdom. Here we have the third parable, the talents. Now we all know this passage. We've heard it preached several times. Where the servants were given talents by their master before he went on a journey. It doesn't indicate how long he's going to be gone, but when he returns, he's going to give the ser- he's going to call for the servants that he gave the talents to, and he wants them to give account of how they handled what was given to them. The first two servants they did extremely well. There was three of them, three servants. They invested and doubled the talents that was originally given to them. One had five, doubled it to ten. So the master, when he came, was was very, very pleased indeed. And and, and he put them in charge of many other things because he knew they were faithful. He knew they could handle it. Well, just a couple of words later, we see how very sad it is to read that the last servant, who had only one talent, just, just one, not much, is it? Just one talent. He went out, and he dug a hole in the ground, and he buried the talent. And all oh, the master was not pleased not pleased at all, and called him a lazy and wicked servant and took his talent away from that person, away from the servant, and gave it to the first servant who had ten talents. But this is such a sad story, but I'm sad to say even more sadder that it's like many of us today. We hide behind more talented people, and I used to do that <clears throat> Many years ago, I used to do that. We get behind people who are bigger than us. We think are more important than us. We get behind people we think are more righteous. Let me tell you, the Bible says no one is righteous. No, not one. It's only through Jesus Christ, our Savior that we become righteous when we put on his robe of righteousness because all of ours are filthy rags. We can hide in the back of the sanctuary. How many times I've done that. 
on the fringes of the group. You know, you're, you're with the group, but you're kind of on the sideline. We're in the middle of the crowd. Nobody will notice me now, so I'm in the middle of the crowd. There's all kinds of hiding places. Places where others won't find us. But if you're thinking that nobody can find you, and nobody can notice, Jesus Christ does. He sees everything. He knows everything. He knows you're going to hide before you hide. You see, he notices because this parable is not about how much the church needs you and your gifts, though it most certainly does. But this parable is about how to live in readiness for the coming of Jesus Christ. And the servant soon learned in our parable that he cannot hide from the master. Simply stated, watch means using your talents, whatever they may be. It could be just from passing out a bulletin at the door. It could be up here singing and preaching. And let me tell you, I'm singing and preaching, but you do not see my knees shaking. God didn't promise us an easy road, but he promised he'd be with us. He promised to give us words when we need to hear them. It could be someone downstairs looking after the kitchen. It could be someone that's coming along with you because they want to show support while you're singing or preaching. It could be helping a neighbor next door. Maybe you just have a talent for listening. Because everything, all that we do, when we do it for Jesus Christ, based on his words and in line with his holy scripture, we are using the talents that he has given us. Many years ago, Billy Graham, and we're all familiar with him, was asked about his life, ministry, and family. And the interviewer that posed, posed this question, he said to him, he said, looking back over a life well lived, what is left? Well, he said, what do you desire the most? So Mr. Graham thought for a moment, and with a voice filled with emotion, he said, what I desire most of all is to one day hear my Lord speak the words. And he quoted from Matthew 25, 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. What beautiful words from the master's lips to hear. Are you longing to hear these words? I know I sure am. I'm not perfect. And I have my quirks and quarks and all of that, but I've got Jesus Christ. And when I do wrong, he'll let me know. We need to be always listening for that still, small voice. If we're longing to hear those words from Jesus' lips, put our talents, whatever they are, even if it was just a... I know that you have scarves here indicating where we can and cannot sit on the back of the chairs. The person who did that God bless you because you were using, it's a talent for the Lord. You used, God used you to do that. 
So whatever they are, to use in increasing the kingdom of God, you will be watching. Because watching means using your talents to increase his kingdom. Even if it's just a small word, like yesterday, Bill and I stayed at my sister's new apartment and, and waited for her to, for a piece of furniture to arrive that she had ordered. And I said to the delivery guy, I said, rather than have you come back up over these stairs, there's only one set of stairs in the apartment, that's the come and go. I said, I'll come down with you. I said, so you won't have to walk back up over the stairs. He said, God bless you. I said, he sure does. He blesses me every day and loves me too. I said, and I love him. So even just those small little words means watching, talent. Always be ready. When the Lord gives you a chance, don't be afraid. Speak it. If they don't want to hear it, they'll tell you, and then you move on. But you've done what you've done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Just use it. Use your talents, whatever it is. Maybe it's just singing, and, and, and somebody hears you singing. Maybe it, you go into a hospital to, to pay a visit to someone sick. You know, there was a song written many years ago by Ray Boltz. I'm sure many of you heard him. He said, thank you. It's a title, thank you for giving to the Lord. We won't know what we have done until we get up there in heaven. You see, people are watching. They're watching how, if we're walking the walk and talking the talk, So walk the talk and talk the walk. Our fourth answer is found in Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, and this is Jesus talking, Come, you blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and we clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it, Unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And then he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they will answer him also, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, 
or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The emphasis is on verse 40. Inasmuch as you did it unto me, unto these, the least of my brethren, you did it unto me. And if you did not, the reverse is true. If you did not, you did not do it unto me. Many years ago, a story was told about a young man returned from fighting in the Vietnam War. He arrived in California. When he arrived there, he decided to phone home to his parents, who were living in a high society level of Boston. His parents relished the cocktail parties, circuit party crowd, and everything that goes along with that. He called home. His mom answered the phone. He said, Mom, I just called to tell you that I want to bring a war buddy home with me. Mom said, okay, we'll bring him along for a few days. But Mom, said the young man, there's something you need to know. He was very badly injured in the war. One leg, one arm were blown off, one eye is gone, and his face is disfigured. Is it still all right with you if I bring him home? And said the mom, well, I guess so. Bring him home for a few days. But mom, you don't understand me, said the son. I want to bring him home to live with us. The mother began making excuses. I don't know, she said. Someone like that is going to feel embarrassed around our friends. And what would people think? The mother continued to go on and on and on with her excuses, so the son just kind of hung up on her. Later on that day, a few hours later, mom received a phone call from a California police officer and told her that they just found a young man with one arm, one leg, one eye, and a mangled face. He just committed suicide. And his identification papers say he is your son. Would the young man's life have had a different ending had she known that it was her son was the mangled veteran? In terms of the parable Jesus gave, it does not really matter. Jesus says that we are judged based on our response to him. And since he is disguised in the appearance of human need, our response to the needs of others around us reveals the true attitude of our heart. The needs that Jesus talk about, talks about are simple deeds. Someone is hungry, thirsty, needs a friend, needs clothing, sick, and needs care. These are simple needs, and they have simple solutions. Just caring for the simple needs of needy people. But they're not only simple needs, they are basic needs. Jesus is not saying here that we need to, uh, that caring for these needs means that we have to donate large sums of money 
to charity or that we have to travel long distances to preach the gospel or that we have to establish big organizations to change the world or anything of that sort. No, he's simply saying that the basic needs of the people around us give us the opportunity to show Jesus how much we care about him. In other words, do you and I care? Do we care enough about others to go about meeting their simple and basic needs? Because you see, watching means caring for the simple and basic needs of others. Do we not go a certain place because, oh, I can't go there. I mean, they're not, you know, maybe these guys are on welfare or whatever. Who do we think we are? When we, when we do that, we're looking Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be blunt. We're looking Jesus Christ in the face saying, Lord, I'm not going there. I'm better than they are. You're saying you're better than the Lord? We're not better than him. We could never do what Jesus has done. We would never go to, would we go to a cross to forgive the world of its sins? I mean, we got a lot of hard criminals out here. I think of Adolf Hitler as one. But Jesus died for him. We need to put aside and that goes for me too, and I'm preaching to myself this morning as well. We need to put aside our pride. Pride goes before a fall, the Bible says. Put away the pride. They have a right, these people, to be fed spiritually, physically. They have a right to know that Jesus cares. And that's what Jesus did. He cared for the people. He cared for their needs. And then he told them about what or who he was. There are four ways of watching for the return of Jesus. Those are the four ways. If you doubt that Jesus is coming again, you better think again. When we do not know, but we know that we are living in the last days, the Bible tells us, giving us the signs. We don't know when he's coming, but we know that planet Earth is almost over. There's an old thing I used to have written in my Bible when I was a young girl that said Jesus first, others second, yourself last it stands for the word joy you want to hear those words well done thou good and faithful servant thou has been faithful over a few things I will make you ruler over many things enter now into the joy of thy Lord I don't know about you, but I plan on hearing those words when that sky cracks open. We have to lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again, and we must be preparing now for the moving day. For the moving day is a coming.